You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Hi everyone, Amanda here. I'm just stopping by to ask you for your feedback on the show. It is important to us here at The Dead Prussian to deliver a show that our listeners enjoy. You can leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to our website and fill in the survey at www.thedeadprussian.com slash survey.html. We'd love to hear from you. G'day listeners, it is Mick here. Welcome to episode 12 of the Dead Prussian podcast. First, I'd like to point everyone in the direction of the Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia. It is a new organisation that is designed to encourage innovation through entrepreneurial spirit within the Australian Defence Force. You can check us out at Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia on Facebook, on the Grounded Curiosity page on groundedcuriosity.com, or on Twitter, uh, which is where I hang out a lot, at D-E-F underscore A-U-S. Check it out. Uh, Send us any questions if you have them. You can also engage me on Twitter or the Dead Prussian uh, accounts and let me um, explain to you why you should be interested in the Defence Entrepreneurs Forum. Also, thanks to all those people who provided the iTunes reviews and I do know there are some reviews coming on some of the other platforms. I'm still the uh, techno troglodyte that you all know and love, so I will get to those reviews as soon as possible. I also thank you all for participating in the anonymous survey on the website. I'm hearing a lot of what you want, and uh, what I have decided is that all those comments that are positive about the host are highly accurate, and all those comments that are not positive about the host are probably uh, statistical anomalies. I'd also like to uh, point out that we have some uh, great cooperation going on between ourselves, uh, the Strategy Bridge, Ground and Curiosity, War on the Rocks. These are websites that support us. I also listen to the Modern War Institute podcast quite a bit. So make sure you check these out. If you're looking for links to these places, go to our website, go to the War College, check out websites, podcasts, and pretty soon I'll be opening up the book section for you. Okay, so anyone who knows me knows that I like comic books, which is interesting because today's topic is not necessarily about comic books, but it did enable me to go visit the comic book store and look like a goose in front of the comic book staff when I was looking for our guest book. And uh, our guest is uh, famous for a particular book and a movie that was made out of that book. And therefore, I thought I should be searching in the zombie section for a historical novel, a graphic novel, about World War I. It only took 40 minutes of looking and then uh, asking at the counter. I confused the people at the counter And then they asked me if I'd looked in the war section. I was looking for a historical graphic novel on war. I did not even look in the war section of the local comic book store. So there's a story about me being a goose for you. What is our topic today? Our topic today is on exploring war through art. Our guest today uh, is Max Brooks. Uh, Max is an author, public speaker, non-resident fellow with the Modern War Institute at West Point and Senior Resident Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Art of Future Warfare Project. Now, I know all the listeners know about the Art of Future Warfare Project. That's why we're going to have a good chat about it today. And he's also the author of World War Z and the Harlem Hellfighters. And the Harlem Hellfighters is the book that I was looking for, found, a read very easily in one sitting, and it's going to be part of the topic today. G'day, Max. How are you going? Good to see you. How's it going? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. All right, so I've just given everyone the official version of you with a little anecdote about how I can't uh, navigate myself through a comic book store, which is kind of good. Means <laughs> I've means I've grown up since I was fifteen. Um, my first uh, question is: uh, Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, people uh, listening to this podcast may not necessarily link um, World War Z author with Modern War Institute at West Point. So, can you give us the uncensored or maybe censor a little bit because I need a clean label on my podcast, but right. the, the unbridled version of Max Brooks. Okay. Well, uh, I would say that un, unbridled is uh, I'm probably, there's probably nobody out there that I have yet met like me. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing. Uh, I should say that, that 
I'm a Gen Xer in America, you know, what we Americans call a Gen Xer. I'm in my, my early 40s. But uh, I'm not the child of an American baby boomer. I'm the child of a World War II veteran. Yeah. So I grew up hearing stories about World War II. Mm-hmm. My dad was in initially field artillery and then combat engineers. Uh, but these are the stories that I heard. So I was always sort of fascinated by it, fascinated by history. But I was also blessed with a curse called dyslexia, which is a learning disability. Mm-hmm. So for me, uh, a school was a real slog. And I learned how to read through comic books and audiobooks and all sort of alternative methods. But it also sort of gave me a jump on critical thinking at a very early age. Um and I was, I was always just also blessed with uh, an obsessive compulsive fear. Uh, so when I saw my first zombie movie when I was about 13, I just totally freaked out. <laughs> and I thought, what would I really do in a zombie plague? Uh, but growing up in Hollywood, I realized what you see in the movies is for entertainment purposes. Uh, yeah. you ne- you're never going to see a zombie movie where somebody dies of dehydration. <laughs> You know, I've, I've never I've never seen a zombie show where our alpha male character drinks from a puddle and uh, diarrheas himself to death. Well, the special effects guys could have fun with that. Yes, I think that would that would be an awesome job. If I was doing a, a zombie movie, my guy would drink out of a puddle and just cholera himself all over the floor. <laughs> It'd be hard getting Brad Pitt to play that role, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that would happen. Uh, you know, maybe Ryan Reynolds would be good for it. But yeah. uh, so I'm, I was always obsessed with detail. So I sat down and, and wrote a book in, in the late 90s for me. I think it was going to be published, a Zombie Survival Guide of yeah. literally how would you really survive a zombie attack? It got published. People loved it. And then when it came time to write another book, I didn't want to just do a zombie uh, small unit story because everybody does that. Yeah. So I, I wanted to do a big global oral history. And that's where World War Z. Now, all right. Now, we're all children of the empire. Do you say Z or Z? Uh, we say uh, Z here in Australia, but uh, okay. so half our audience know. is in the US, so go either okay. way. So World War Z in America, World War Z if you're Australian, Canadian, British, uh, even New Zealand. Yeah. So, and ironically, some of my ideas for uh, World War Z, I picked up when I was traveling through the empire, through South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. uh, And that that gave me a a sort of a global, part of my global perspective on it. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Um, I do have a a question from someone who knew that we were going to have a chat today was, um, did you calculate how many (laughs) zombies it would take to reach the top of the wall and jump onto the chopper? Uh, I think that scene's in uh, Israel, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's see, in the movie they use fast zombies, and yeah. and I'm not a fast zombie guy for for mm. many many reasons. Uh, one of which, <clears throat> there there's a there's a psychological element to fast zombies, as there aren't any threats. You know, I've lived long enough to know that the more obvious the threat, the greater the response. <clears throat> it's like it's like viruses. If a virus is airborne, then the World Health Organization jumps in, and you know. Uh, the American public, the global public, we get in there. We get in there fast. But if it's a slow creeping virus like AIDS, yeah, it, it could be years before we actually realize how dangerous it is. And to me, like AIDS is the slow zombie. Yeah. Whereas the fast zombie is Ebola. I mean, look at Ebola. The U.S. Army got involved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the recent um, efforts to combat that um, in you know, the uh, west coast of Africa, like they, they put a lot into that, didn't they? Yeah, which imagine how it must have felt if you're if you're dying of AIDS or malaria, and suddenly this convoy of American soldiers goes roaring by you to take care of the Ebola folks. Yeah, I mean we um in Australia the Malarial Institute is actually a Australian Army organisation um, because of the region that we live in. Um, it's quite prevalent, um, but you look at yeah, it's it's not it's you know it's what people often call Chapter Five or non-standard military operations, but when you look at the threat that it poses. You know, strategically yeah. to nation state survival and nation state collapse and, and you look at where we work we work in a lot quite often we'll find our militaries off they go to um, collapse nation states to deal with the security situations there a a pandemic um, which essentially is what world war z is about isn't it you know it's yeah. it's a pandemic global pandemic and and you you know you bring up a really good point which is you know, because of where Australia is, the the fear, the anxiety of infection 
is in your face every day. So it's it's in your conscious thought. I mean, you're on a continent where basically everything is poisonous. Yeah. yeah. You know, every every life form in Australia has venom. Uh, so you're always conscious of that as opposed to America where the notion of a, a germ, an infectious disease, uh, it's just it's just not seen as a threat. So therefore, we're always behind the curve in America. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be nice to go out in the bush and not have to worry about snakes or spiders or yeah. drop bears, but you know, these things happen. Uh-huh. I, I remember, I remember reading in World War II that part of the Australian battle plan, in case the Japanese invaded, was just pull back, yeah. pull back to the south, and let all the snakes and the jack jumpers just do their job first. Yeah, well, a, a small element uh, apparently landed in the northwest of Australia and just died. Um, due to the, the environment. Um, so, yeah, and it's it's like when the Dutch, um, Dirk Hartog, explored and found parts of Australia well before the British did, but the parts of Australia he found was like, yeah, there's something there, but it's not really worth going to because it'll kill you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's yeah, one of those things that, you know, nature is, uh, is quite impressive sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so your journey into, into World War Z um, got you exploring, you know, a global war of sorts. Um, is this is this what got you interested to take your creative skills, and explore war further? I mean, you're you, you're a, a a you know a fiction writer um, yeah. who's worked in multiple mediums, um, and you're also advising uh, as a non non a non resident fellow at the Modern War Institute, you know, the think tank inside the military academy at West Point. So that's quite a leap for some people that don't normally see those lines blurred. How, yeah. how, how did this all come about? You know, I think, I think it, it came about, honestly, if you want to go really far back in my life, it came about because of this, this, this dyslexia that I had where mm. I, had to, I had to learn any way I could. And so one of my biggest teachers about geopolitics, technology, was Tom Clancy. Uh, yep. because, because Tom Clancy was, a, was an outsider. He was a wannabe. And so therefore, he took the, the model of Ian Fleming, which was pure fantasy, and threw it away. Yeah. And the irony was Ian Fleming had actually done this stuff. Yeah. yeah, he was searching for something that was not the norm for him. No, Ian Fleming was trying to escape that world. Tom Clancy was trying to get into it. Yeah. And so therefore, when you put down a Clancy book, especially an early one like Red Storm Rising or Red October – you felt educated as well as entertained. And even as a kid, I knew if I was going to be a writer, that's the kind of writer I wanted to be. So everything I did, everything I continue to do is steeped in, in tremendous amounts of research. And, and I think that's why it has resonated with the military because everything I do is based in the library. It's not stuff I, I just pull out of my behind. Yeah, well, we've, um, we've recently had uh, Ghost Fleet author August Cole on the... Um on the on the show and we talked about their research based um book ghost fleet uh, the one he wrote with peter singer which is and, a brilliant book it's, it's, it's like yeah. it's like the new worn remembrance it's 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 an excellent um an excellent book and you know he talks a lot about tom clancy and, and that research based thing and you know i said to him you know apart from the fact that it made it really easy to justify spending that book because i could turn to my wife and say hey look it's actually a textbook um it's um it it, it resonates with it's audiences because it is it is based in something in the future that they've they've researched you know what's happening in tech now and what's happening in development of military capabilities now to show you and i think you know thomas tom clancy was popular because of that as well and i think we'll, you probably find that people from uh the the national security military worlds probably have read more tom clancy than they have ian fleming i think so and and, and i think that what clancy what what he doesn't get enough credit for was he bridges the divide because, yeah. you know, you've, you've got these wonky eggheads who have done nothing but study these deep, serious issues their entire lives. And because they're so immersed in it, A, they don't see the bigger picture. They don't see how the connections outside of their own narrow discipline. And B, even if they have brilliant ideas, they don't know how to communicate it to the general public, yeah. which is as it is as vital to a democracy as anything you have. Uh, if you can't communicate defense issues to the people you're trying to defend, then you should just pack it in. Yeah, telling someone there's an apparent logic is different from showing them there's an apparent logic. 
No, I mean, I, I've I've worked now, uh, I think sort of off and on uh, through the last decade in these sort of military circles, uh, Naval War College, strategic studies groups. Uh, I just got back from SOCOM. And I got to tell you, some of these PowerPoint presentations should be against the Geneva Convention because they, they put you to sleep <laughs> and they're so immersed in these in these numbing clockwork orange details you feel like Malcolm McDowell with your eyes taped open <laughs> yeah. and you just you just think I'm not learning anything from you you and need to be able to to get me excited about what you're talking yeah you almost need a a, a TED talk um, training session for these people so they know how to communicate the idea um, I do um, like that when uh, General Mattis came to Australia and gave a presentation, uh, he was asked about uh, what he thought of PowerPoint. He said, well, the best thing about PowerPoint is if you print it off uh, really um, fast in the morning when it's really cold, you can sit on it and it can warm your butt. <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's good to know um, that, you know, the, the idea that um, putting up a lot of detail and throwing it at someone is is synonymous with explaining and teaching someone to learn it's it's something that's got to change um and what i like uh, about um reading the harlem hellfighters so i will admit to the audience i haven't re read world war z uh, or z um mm. but that, that's mainly because I, I saw the movie and um <laughs> and i've actually got a, a deal at the moment one of my uh, buddies has got world war z i've got harlem hellfighters I'm waiting for him to finish, and then we just swap. I know that doesn't help your book sales, Max, but um, no yeah, problem. <laughs> so I'm just a poor podcast host here. Um, but um, what I liked about um, the Harlem Hellfighters, and for those people who haven't checked it out yet, uh, please do. As always, um, because of an international audience, I'll plug Amazon, but it's available at multiple um, providers. But because Amazon's the one that you can see. Uh, on the web no matter where you are in the world um, they've got it there i found it at my local comic book store after a lot of searching um, and ironically i went the week before international comic day and i could have gotten myself a heap of free comics if i had waited a week um, oh. yeah can, that's just terrible planning um, but uh, it is the story of a um, of a um, african-american regiment in world war one that uh, went and fought on the front line, I think they did the most amount of combat days of any American unit in World War One. Is that correct? They did. Yeah, they did. Um, uh, highly decorated. Uh, they reached the Rhine before. Uh, I think all other Allied soldiers. Um, they were pretty close to the, being the first unit to the Rhine, um, and it is in a graphic novel form. So, as I said to everyone before, who, whoever knows me knows that I read comic books a lot. Um, in fact, uh, another plug for Max, I've just um, started Extinction, Extinction Parade, which is another zombie series that you're doing. Um, That's right. So I've just started that one because I'm a comic book addict. Um, but what I like about Harlem Hellfires is you've used a medium that is very, very accessible to explain the history of a unit. And it's a real history, so it's a fiction work based in a historical um, uh, circumstance on a historical characters. Um and some of those characters are blended together. Um, and what you do is you you bring all the, the issues, you know, the racial um, issues, the prejudicial issues, and also um, the horrors of World War One, which we know in the Great War, you know, it wasn't the smartest fought war. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I like about it is, um, you know, you've taken a graphic novel and you've almost, like for me, um, being a military theory fan, it's almost like an it's almost like an education tool you could give to someone, and they wouldn't know they're being educated. They wouldn't know they're being educated on prejudice, um, military tactics, military equipment, because of the accuracy of um, the way that your the, your illustrator uh, Kane and White has gone to great lengths um, to make sure that it's very very detailed. Um, and you know you always run the risk of of the the uniform pedants out there saying, oh, I didn't read that because the helmet was wrong or something like that. But it's it's a highly accurate book. So graphic novel, telling the story of a history unit. How did that happen? Well, that's a, going back to, to the first point you made about detail, that was actually one of my jobs in addition to being the writer is I was Kanan White's research assistant. Mm. Uh, because I, I like to say that my research stack for Harlem Hellfighters was literally four feet high. But awesome. one solid foot of that was nothing but picture books that I sent to Canaan as far as uniforms, weapons. I mean, little things like how did a black guy in America in 1917 wear his hair? Uh, yeah. Because that 
you educate through pictures. And I got involved in the Harlem Hellfighters years and years ago when I was a little kid. There was a gentleman working for my parents as an assistant. He was from Rhodesia. And he was in America getting his degree in history. And he told me about the Hellfighters. Nobody knew about it. In my whole life, nobody knew about it. And I thought, I want to tell this story. Uh, Hollywood was not interested. You know, they had much more intellectual pursuits like American Pie. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, how do I tell this story? And I didn't want to write it as a straight out novel for two reasons. Uh, number one is if it had been written as a novel, it would have been read by 50 year old white men who already knew that story. Yeah. And I wanted to get the story out to people who'd never heard of them. And so what's great about a comic book is it reaches a, a broader audience, a younger audience, and it also, it makes it human. And, and this is what I think is really lost on so much of not just the military, but academia in general, is we are an emotional species. Yep. We, we, we connect with people on an emotional level. Uh, it's like if, I, if people ask me, what's the best education tool for the Anzacs? in World War I, I would not give them some thousand page doorstopper of a book. I would give them the mini series with Paul Hogan. Yeah. Because to me, I saw that maybe 15 years ago and I'll never forget that moment when they go into the German trench for the first time and they look at what the Germans have been eating and it's such a shock. Yeah. Uh, how much on the ropes we had them. Because to me, that's a human element. So I wanted Harlem Hellfighters to be human. I wanted it to be impactful on an emotional and not just an, an intellectual level. Yeah, I think um, I think you know it's it's achieved. I mean, anyone who reads um, graphic novels or comic books knows that it's almost it, you know it's a it's a it's same as watching a movie in terms of how quickly you can get through uh, the content and you know, the human brain. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say before I state that statistic that you know. Everyone knows 83% of statistics are made up, um, but <laughs> but you know the human mind the human mind processes um, a message in an image about 60,000 times faster than it does the written word. Um, so at times, like yeah, you know, I'll flip through the book and then I'm like, wow, that for some reason I've got to go back and and look at that again because it's it struck a chord. Keep going, then you go back, you're like, wow. Um, some of the some of the scenes in particular, particularly the um, I mean, I won't spoil it for anyone, um, but just don't get attached to any characters if you're reading the book, because um, the, the ones you do get attached to, you won't realise um, may not be the ones you want to be attached to for yeah. close to the end. Um, but yeah, you know, it does that. It, it it brings you in as a in, in a human story. Um, what was the what was the reaction to the Hellfires? I mean, I I picked it up based on a recommendation from August. Um, and yeah, you know, I was kicking myself. I didn't know about it. It'd been kicking around for uh, 2014, I think, was your publication date. Um, yeah, it's a couple of years ago. So, so what was like? What was the reception like? Um, both, I'm, I'm very interested in some of the people that you work with now, and um, and also the wider audience. Was it was it picked up um, as well as World War uh, Z in terms of your audience, or is it something you've seen go to a completely different sort of audience? It's interesting. It, it goes to a different place, but the response has been has been shockingly positive. And to your point about uh, making something visual, I've done some speaking engagements in high schools in America, yeah. literally in Harlem. Yeah. Uh, and the comic book is what has grabbed them. You know, if I had just gone in with a book to tell them the story of the Harlem Hellfighters, and these are black kids living in Harlem, some of which are actually descended from these people, yep. it would not have made an impact. But yeah. when when you open the page and you see an entire page of one guy being hit with a direct artillery shell, and what, as an artillery guy, you know more than anybody yeah. about hyperstatic shock and what happens. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, when high explosive, you don't even have to be killed by shrapnel. When the human body absorbs the energy of an explosion, what happens? Yeah. Well, we can explain it, but to actually see the flesh being blown off the bones, yeah. those kids grabbed it, and then they wanted to know what the words were about. And before you knew it, they were involved. And you know that was how I learned. Yeah, uh, that's how I learned to read. Yeah, I mean it's um, it's pro it's actually. Um, a, I think for a lot of kids, it's it's how they, they they bridge that gap between what they read as children, and then what they read as adults. You know, the comic books kind of fit that those early teenage years. Um, unfortunately, for some people like myself, we get stuck in those early teenage years in both our sense of humour and our 
um, reading habits, which is which oh, yeah. it's, I'm so glad that you're addressing such serious topics um, in the format that I like to consume as well. Um, so we've we've gone. This is you know your journey as a artist. Um, you know World War Z. You know global pandemic. That real world implications of that. Um, be very very careful about relying on um, global health communities that don't get necessarily get supported um, by real uh, infrastructure investment. Then we've gone. Then we've gone to a graphic novel that's actually educational. Um, and uh, during my um, undergrad and also at high school, we studied some about the Holocaust. There's been some very good um, work done with graphic novels and explaining the Holocaust to um, younger audiences. And now we're seeing articles that you're writing uh, for the Modern War Institute about preparing for tomorrow's war um, and the future fight. So for our listeners out there, can you tell us a little bit about, um, if they haven't figured out why uh, you're working with the Modern Institute, uh, one, I've got some very slow listeners out there. Don't don't unsubscribe, guys. I'm trying to help you out. Um, but, you know, you've obviously taken a, an angle that you know, military think tanks don't normally take. What, what what are you bringing to the party at the Modern War Institute and, and how's it going? Well, I think I think what I'm bringing to uh, the party is sort of is is an interdisciplinary holistic look at war yep. in that I don't come from any particular school. So I don't see anything through any particular lens. And I'm able to sort of look out and see the connections. I, I think if if there was a military, if I was in the military, I would be the connections officer. Yeah, that would my job would be to say, well, this virus actually comes about because of the housing bubble in America. And people would say, well, how is West Nile connected to the housing bubble? I'd say, because you now have thousands of of abandoned homes with abandoned swimming pools, which are now breeding grounds for mosquitoes, which are spreading the virus. Yeah. You know, it's those are the kind of connections that I, I bring. I also have psychologically a secret weapon that my more educated colleagues don't have, which is I'm not afraid to look stupid. (laughs) You know, I don't. I don't have a reputation. I think that's a skill academia. I've picked up as well. Um. <laughs> yeah. You know, I so because I don't have a reputation as a serious academic, I can come in and bring these disruptive ideas. Yeah. And I have nothing to lose. I'm not. I'm not going to lose my tenured ship professorship somewhere. Yeah. So I can come along and I can say things like, "Listen, don't be afraid of robots rising up and killing us." What you should be afraid of with automation is putting a billion Chinese people out of work uh, within the course of a year. And that's yeah. going to be a lot of very angry, very hungry young men who are going to want to pick up guns and do something about it. That's the threat of robotics, yeah. not uh, not Terminator 2. Yeah, I mean, um, well, we've got the blueprint on how to fight the machines from the Terminator series anyway. So Yeah, so we're ready. Well, but that's a really good point is that and the, art of, the first article I wrote for the Modern War Institute was uh, we've been ready for the robot war since there was science fiction. Yeah. We've, we've thought about this. We thought it through and we're afraid of it. You know, like I said, fear equals response. But there's no movies. There's no sort of science fiction canon about suddenly gazillions of people out of work yeah. and then going to war. Yeah, that's, um, I guess, you know, it's, it, as, as we said about um, the movies beforehand, it's sometimes it's a hard sell to Hollywood um, to to get some of these movies across. And I mean, if someone with your surname can't sell it in Hollywood, then we're probably out of luck. Um, yeah. But it's, it's interesting, like your recent article uh, about pure risk and preparing for tomorrow's smart minefields, you've kind of extrapolated um lessons from the great war and you know the the great minefield that was the 20th century and how we just decided to seed the majority of these places with mines and and walk away yeah taking it to the future of mining and sea mining so um i'm finding it very interesting i went through the um pure risk um article on that you wrote for modern war and for those people that uh haven't checked it out, go to modernwarinstitute.org, uh, look at their recent articles, look at Max's um, writing there. It's very, very good. They also have a podcast um, episode with Max as well, which is excellent, um, which which helped me um, get the idea to start harassing August for your contact details. <laughs> um, 
but it also ties into the Art of Future Warfare project that you're working on um, as well. Can you, you talk to us a little bit about the Art of Future Warfare project? I mean, the listeners heard a little bit from August, um, but a little bit more from you as well would be quite good. Yeah, you know, basically what we're trying to do is to try to inject uh, creative thought into into warfare. And, you know, I, there are basic tenets that, as, as you know, as a soldier, that you have always needed since the first days of Samaria. You've always needed courage. You've always needed discipline. And as an officer, you need at least a modicum of intelligence, hopefully. Uh, but in the modern world, especially in a counterinsurgency where the rules are changing literally day to day, you need to start looking at warfare. We all need to start looking at warfare almost like improv theater. Mm hmm in which there is no script, in which you have to be quick on your feet and you have to throw the rule book away. And you almost have to be like Bruce Lee in that when Bruce Lee talked about martial arts, he said, you have to be fluid. You can't be shackled to some sort of dogmatic uh, art form or science. He said, it has to be art as much as science. And that's what we're doing with the art of future warfare is trying to visualize the wars of the future. And, and that, goes to something much bigger, which is the United States military is having a very healthy nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. which they should have had after Vietnam. You know, after Vietnam, psychologically, the U.S. military did the worst thing they could have done, which is sort of run screaming right back to their comfort zone, which yeah. is tanks in West Germany. Sort of like bottling up the bad thing that happened. Yeah. And, and what should have happened after Vietnam was how can we have gone through 20 years of conflict and not come out of it with the biggest counterinsurgency school the world's ever seen? Yeah. And I think what I am starting to pick up on, I think one of the reasons I keep getting invited to contribute is the military is starting to be open to new ideas, new ways of thinking, uncomfortable ways of thinking, which I think is going to pay massive dividends in the future. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. I mean, you you had me at um, theatre and Bruce Lee philosophy. If anyone who's uh, met me knows that uh, I'm a musical theatre geek um, and uh, I've got a lot of Bruce Lee statues around uh, my house, which mostly is just to annoy my wife. But um, <laughs> but it's interesting the, um, the using the creative process to remind people of the lessons they've learnt so that institutional lessons are not necessarily forgotten but turned into something that can be a blueprint to work with for the future. Um, I do like the fact that it, you know the Art of Future Warfare project opens up um, competitions for people to explore their creativity. I do know that um, some Australian military officers um, entered the uh, third offset strategy creative writing um, contest. Um, well, all creative. It was just a, wasn't just writing, was it? It was a general contest for the third offset strategy. I think. Yeah. Which and I think that's a that's another sort of a angle that the Art of Future Warfare is trying to do is bring an international element to it. Yeah. Uh, which you can always find these examples in history, which is that Pearl Harbor was not invented by the Japanese. It was learned from Taranto. It was learned from that, that British raid using little swordfish biplanes sticking three Italian battleships. Yeah. And everybody ignored that raid as, as sort of a hiccup, except for a few really smart guys in the Japanese Imperial Navy. Yeah. And I think we're, we should be open to ideas no matter where they come from. Yeah, the um, I mean, the Japanese uh, military of the early 20th century, um, right up until I mean, right up until their their first real ever uh, defeat at the end of World War II, uh, they demonstrated um, learning from these things. Uh, they they took the Battle of Trafalgar, um, they took Nelson's tactics, reversed it, and then kicked the Russians' butt in the Russia-Japanese war yep. out at sea. It's it 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 is important for uh, people to take, and you know, often disruptive thinking is seen as being capital D disruptive and lowercase t thinking, but disruptive thinking is about applying uh, lessons in a different way to achieve a better result, um, but still aiming for an organisational benefit, um, which, yeah, I think um, the, the art of future warfare, um, it's probably uh, spent too much time in my browser history uh, for anyone. Um, if my boss is listening to this, I don't do it at work. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's amazing because you know, for people who haven't checked it out, look, jump on there. You will see artists' renderings. You know, it's not just people writing short stories or um, or, or articles. It is it is artists trying to visually depict the future battlefield. Um, so for a, a sci-fi geek, um, and and as I said, you know, a comic book geek, visual 
kind of learner, I find it quite fascinating the way that we can start to educate people on what we expect future warfare to look like. And I I think what's also great about Art of Future Warfare is it has the potential to reach the broader public, which is what we talked about before, that, you know, defending a democracy is one of the hardest things to do. Uh, because you have to you have to educate that democracy you're defending and try to explain these big, broad strategic concepts to the voter and say, listen, this is why you are paying these taxes and voting for these expensive programs. Yeah. And if you can't do that, then it doesn't matter how great your military is if its hands are tied by its inability to communicate. And that, that's one of the things Art of Future Warfare is trying to do. Yeah, it's it's like, I guess a broad communication tool. Um... Yeah, I like it because you know it's, it's on the internet too, and so it means you know it can act, anyone can access it around the world. This is not a uniquely U.S. Uh, project by a U.S. think tank that's aiming solely at U.S. military thinkers. It is out there for everyone to get involved in and have a look at and understand the bigger, broader picture. And we can only all benefit from that. All right, Max, uh, we're up to the the final question. The the standard required question of all my guests who come on the show. Um, and this question links back to um, our roots as the Dead Prussian podcast and our, our <laughs> homage to um, Clausewitz and uh, trying to pursue the philosophical um, understanding of war and what war is. Um, so I will, uh, I will start a sentence and I'll ask you to finish that sentence, but I will put the caveat that if you uh, use any of the standard responses by a, a dead general, um, uh. you, you will probably receive a resubmit because the listeners have have taken note and some of the surveys have provided this was I've let people off the hook by providing a Clausewitzian definition in the past. I caveat that with the people that I let do that were Clausewitz scholars and therefore, you know, just the sheer amount of effort they've put into their field of study, that's fine. Uh, however, you don't get that option. Um, if you uh, if you throw zombies in there, I might also veto that as well. Um, so, can you finish the sentence for me? War is history and fast forward. Awesome, that is awesome. That is a brand new definition. So that is war is history in fast forward. That's uh, that is has thrown me because that is one I did not expect. I'm going to have to think on that. Not too deeply because I'm not a deep thinker, but war is history and fast forward, which yes. uh, that, that that's good. That supports nearly everything we've talked about tonight. Um, you're much smarter than me. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I was kind of hoping I was going to get to you to resubmit on that, uh, on that one, but um, that's good. We're, uh, we're going to build a war is wall on our website so that people can see all the definitions we've got. We've got some unique ones. We've also had, This one now, your recent foray into uh, dealing with um, the military world in the past decade, you might appreciate this one as well. And I think anyone who's in the military will appreciate this one. One of our listeners, uh, Jack, uh, sent me one uh, this week. was um, A war is easier than filling out a form. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And it goes back to that PowerPoint methodology of the bureaucratic processes that sometimes um enable the way that we get to places and uh, get all that logistical support that we require sometimes uh, constraints uh, our thinking on war um, and ensuring that we don't have that bureaucratic uh, mindset towards the execution of war and warfare so war is history and fast forward you heard that from max brooks Uh, Max, thank you very much for coming on the show today Uh, i look forward to i think world war z2 is in production is that right that's what they tell me. I'm I'm actually probably more connected to the Pentagon than I am to Hollywood. At this point. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's excellent. So that means that there's no morning teas or coffee um, dates with Brad coming up anytime soon. Yeah, there is, but you know, for some reason, he still won't let me in his house. Oh, <laughs> really? I guess just standing at the window and looking in is kind of weird. So maybe try knocking on the front door. Um, I guess it, yeah, I guess it doesn't count camping on his lawn and saying <laughs> we're buddies. I don't know. That's excellent. All right, Max, thanks very much for uh, coming on the show. For all those people uh, that want to see more of Max's work, um, I encourage you to go to the Modern War Institute to look at his work in that space. Check out the Art of uh, Future Warfare for the um, the project that he's working on with uh, those guys. Also, get yourself a copy of the Harlem Hellfighters. I can personally recommend that as a great uh, read. 
Uh, World War Z, uh, the mate who's reading it at the moment, is absolutely loving it. And he found it through the library systems. So, you know, it is uh, out there. Um, but for Max's interest, please make sure you buy yourself a copy. And also, uh, for those people that are comic book addicts and have comicsology like myself, check out the Extinction, Extinction Parade if you are into exploring these issues through things such as zombies and uh, vampires. It's a very interesting uh, series with some great artwork again. So, Max, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks very much for listening to episode 12 uh, on exploring war through art. Uh, for those who uh, have not uh, yet done it, we do have iTunes reviews that uh, can support the show. The more iTunes reviews you provide and the more stars you uh, give us uh, helps us get out to a broader audience. And you know that our goal on this show is to take uh, serious topics about military theory, uh, war, warfare, contemporary conflict to a broader audience to help everyone uh, engage on these very serious topics. So, uh, jump on iTunes, give us a review. As I've said before, feel free to give us five stars. Feel free to give us four stars. Feel free to give us three stars. If you're giving us one or two stars, uh, please think that, think that uh, you, you may feel more generous than the keyboard and, and try again. Um, if you want to give us a one or a two star, I actually don't mind. That's fine. I appreciate any of the feedback. Provide us feedback through the survey. If you do not like the show... Um, that's fine. Um, don't listen to it, but still download it because you keep my stats going up. Although I, I don't know why you'd still be listening to me now if you didn't like the show. Um, please check out our website. And as I said at the start, check out Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia. It's, uh, it's going to be uh, quite an event uh, in December, uh, 8th and 9th of December here in Canberra. And we've got August Cole coming on as a speaking guest to talk about Ghost Fleet and how we can learn the lessons of the, the blueprint of the future war. Uh, until next time, though, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution Licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.